Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. Along with kangaroos and koalas, the monotreme stand out as icons of Australia's endemic wildlife, being quite unlike any other group of mammals. Although the duck-billed platypus is by far the most well-known representative, particularly to people living outside Australia, monotremata also contains the spiny insectivorous echidnas, which resemble surprisingly cute fusions of hedgehogs, anteaters and pangolins. Often referenced in relation to their supposedly bizarre anatomy, the monotremes have been viewed as something of a joke since they were first encountered by British colonial settlers at the end of the 18th century. The platypus in particular, with its sensitive toothless bill, venomous spurs and egg-laying habits, was viewed as a potential hoax when the first specimens were shipped back to London in 1798. In addition to the traits mentioned above, the platypus, as well as their echidna relatives, possess electroreceptors in their snout for locating prey, a cloaca that contains both the anus and reproductive organs, as well as lacking teeth in mature individuals. Indeed, the presence of a cloaca explains the term monotreme, which means single hole. The forelimbs are larger and stronger than the hindlimbs. Due to the fact that the newly hatched fetus-like young, adorably known as puggles, must crawl towards their mother's belly in order to feed. The females do not possess defined nipples, with milk instead emanating from patches directly onto the stomach. Interestingly, the shoulder girdles of monotremes contain extra bones that are not found in any other mammal group, which may have something to do with the sprawling posture of these animals when walking. Their internal body temperatures are low when compared to other mammals, with an average of 31 degrees or 88 degrees Fahrenheit, although this is thought to be the result of the highly derived and marginal niches inhabited by modern forms, and not necessarily representative of ancient species. This complex array of features, as well as DNA analysis, has shown that monotremes are a very basal lineage of mammals with it being estimated that these animals must have diverged between 186 and 163 million years ago, during the first half of the Jurassic. This is backed up by the fact that the rodent-like multituberculates, which are more derived than the monotremes, first appear in the fossil record during the Middle Jurassic. However, the oldest known monotreme fossils date to the early Cretaceous of Australia, strongly suggesting that the group first evolved in the temperate south polar forests of southern Gondwana. We are currently in the dark regarding monotreme evolution before this point. It was thought that these animals might have been very derived members of a mysterious group of mammals known as the Australosphenidans. This dubious clade is known solely from dental fossils recovered from much of ancient Gondwana, with these forms being present from the Middle Jurassic to the late Cretaceous. Their distinctive molar teeth possess three peaked crowns, a condition known as tribosphenic, which also characterises modern therian mammals. Although the monotremes lack teeth as adults, juvenile platypodes and fossil members of the clade do possess tribosphenic molars as well. Because of this, some paleontologists have argued that monotremes are the direct descendants of the Australosphenidans, a theory thought to be strengthened by the fact that both groups were native to Gondwana. However, a study published in 2022 examining monotreme evolution noted that the oldest known member of the clade, Tainolophos, differed substantially from other non-monotreme Australosphenidans, having five molars as opposed to the three in all other non-monotreme Australosphenidans and having non-tribosphenic molars, meaning that the two groups were likely unrelated. Flannery and co-authors suggested that the core grouping of Australosphenidans, excluding the monotremes, were actually stem therians, being closer to marsupials and placentals. If this is indeed the case, then we are back to square one when considering the early evolution of monotremes, with these animals probably possessing a long ghost lineage leading back into the Jurassic. It would perhaps be best to return to the oldest known genus of monotreme, Tenolophos. This tiny, shrew-sized insectivore, which is an estimated 10 centimetres long, and is by far the smallest member of the clade, being known from four specimens recovered from early Cretaceous rocks in Victoria, Australia, dated to approximately 123 million years ago. Like its modern relatives, Tainolophos would have possessed fairly elongated, narrow jaws, as well as adaptations for electroreception although its teeth suggest a diet composed of small insects and other invertebrates. It would have also lacked a beak, 
and certainly would have had a stronger bite force than the platypus, perhaps resembling living small insectivorous mammals such as shrews and tenrex. Also unlike living monotremes, which have suspended ear bones much like placentals and marsupials, Tainolophos still had them connected to the jaw via the Meckel's cartilage, resembling the condition found in non-mammalian cynodonts. This reinforces the idea that the modern ear condition evolved independently in both monotremes and therians. Tainolophos would have inhabited a cool, temperate, forested environment unlike any found in the Holocene, with this tiny animal having to endure cold and incredibly dark south polar winters that would have lacked light for months at a time. It has been theorised that the evolution of electroreception in monotremes may have been an adaptation to such harsh conditions, with animals like Tainolophos using their sensitive snouts to probe beneath snow and moss in order to locate prey in the darkness. Other early monotremes were substantially larger animals. The controversial genus Colicodon, which is known from an opalized jaw fragment, possessed distinctive crushing molar teeth adapted for processing shellfish or tough plant material, with the whole animal possibly measuring up to one metre long. However, it has also been suggested that Colicodon may have been a Haramyodon mammal instead. Another large early monotreme is far more definitively a member of the clade, with this being the genus Steropodon. The holotype is represented by another piece of opalized fossil jawbone, complete with tribosphenic molars, suggesting that the animal was either a carnivore or insectivore or both. Living in the middle Cretaceous of Lightning Ridge, New South Wales, Steropodon was quite large for a Cretaceous-era mammal, potentially measuring up to 50 centimeters or 20 inches long, roughly the size of a Virginia opossum. Examination of the jaw fragment revealed a mandibular canal, which has been proposed to indicate the presence of a bill, similar to that of the living platypus. This may suggest that Steropodon possessed a comparable semi-aquatic lifestyle, although without more detailed fossil finds, this will remain conjectural. While it is clear that monotremes thrived in Cretaceous Australia, it has long been assumed that the group were present across the South Polar region, probably also inhabiting Antarctica, Zealandia and South America during the Mesozoic. This hypothesis was confirmed by the discovery of the genus Patagorhynchus from Maastrichtian age deposits in Argentina, confirming that monotremes had reached South America and therefore also Antarctica by the late Cretaceous. Known only from a single molar tooth, this was very similar in structure to those of modern platypus juveniles and their close extinct relatives indicating that Patago rhynchus may have had a similar appearance and ecological niche, feeding on freshwater snails, clams and crustaceans. The description of this genus proves that platypus-like semi-aquatic monotremes had already appeared during the late Cretaceous, and therefore survived the KPG extinction event. As far as we know, the first members of the modern platypus family Ornithorhynchidae first appeared during the Paleocene, and interestingly not in Australia. Indeed, the oldest known ornithorhynchid was the genus Monotrematum, from the early Paleocene of Patagonia, and dating to roughly 61 million years ago. Little is known about this animal, as the holotype is comprised of a few isolated teeth, but these were very similar to those of later Miocene platypodes, albeit larger and more robustly built. This indicates that Monotrematum fed on tough-shelled aquatic prey, possessing a fairly strong bite in order to do so. From here, the monotreme fossil record goes quiet until the late Oligocene, when the genus Obdurodon first appears at the Etaduna formation in the Tirari Desert of South Australia, represented by the species O. insignis. A second, better represented species, Obdurodon dixoni, was recovered from the famous Riversley fossil bearing region of Queensland and is known from both teeth and semi complete skulls. A third species, O. Theralcus child, was also described from mid to late Miocene age deposits at Riversley. It would have looked very similar to the living platypus, although may have been up to twice as large, and retained crushing molars into adulthood. The bill would have been flatter and more spoon-shaped than the modern platypus, with this in combination with its size, suggesting that Obdurodon was more actively predatory, feeding in the water column and near to the surface. Its robust teeth would have enabled the consumption of bigger prey than that of its living cousin, 
including frogs, turtles and lungfish, in addition to crustaceans. The modern genus Ornithorhynchus first appears in the fossil record during the late Miocene, roughly 9 million years ago. These shy, nocturnal, semi-aquatic mammals inhabit the eastern coastline of Australia as well as the island of Tasmania, where they dwell in streams and rivers. The platypus is of course a strong swimmer, with webbed feet and a flattened tail, enabling it to power through the water with a very unique swimming stroke, powered solely by the forelimbs. It dives down to the riverbed in order to search for its preferred prey, which includes worms, insect larvae, yabbies and shrimp. The platypus do not utilise eyesight, hearing or smell when seeking out their next meal, with the animals closing their eyes, ears and nostrils while diving instead relying on a complex system of electroreceptors that line the bill. This feature allows the platypus to detect the small electric charge given off by the muscles of its prey. Like many basal mammalian lineages, ornithorhynchids and other monotremes possess spurs located at their ankles, which are utilised for self-defence and competition for mates, with male platypodes having venomous tarsal spurs that are capable of delivering incredibly painful wounds to animals as large as humans. Due to their iconic appearance, the platypus has become a symbol of Australia internationally, with the animal best known for its seemingly bizarre mishmash of traits. In recent years, the most famous and beloved platypus in popular culture is certainly Perry, the secret agent and egg-laying mammal of action from the Disney Channel show Phineas and Ferb. Although his cyan coloration may seem like a surreal touch, it has recently been found that platypodes glow a similar greenish blue when exposed to black light, a case of life imitating art. The seemingly very different spiky and terrestrial echidnas are in fact close relatives of the ornithorhynchids, having diverged from them between 19 and 48 million years ago. Although the modern short-beaked echidna can be found across the Australian mainland, the fossil record of these animals is very sparse, with it being suggested that these animals evolved on what is now New Guinea during the Cenozoic. Indeed, four species can be found here in modern times, suggesting a degree of prior diversification. In addition, many aspects of echidna anatomy, including their robust forelimbs, electrosensitive tube-like bills, and effective swimming ability, suggests that they developed from semi-aquatic, platypus-like ancestors in the absence of competition from marsupials. Very shy animals, the slow-moving echidnas protect themselves by rolling into a ball much like a hedgehog, presenting their spiny coats to the potential attacker. Possessing powerful forelimbs equipped with sharp, curved claws, these animals are fantastic diggers and are capable of ripping open rotting logs and anthills in search of their favourite insectoid prey. Like the unrelated anteaters and pangolins, echidnas have very small mouths and tube-shaped snouts that lack teeth, with the animals relying on a long sticky tongue to lap up ants and termites. The endemic New Guinean echidnas of the genus Zaglossus live in more moist forested ecosystems and primarily consume worms and insect larvae instead. Females will lay a small single egg about 22 days after mating which will hatch into a tiny fetus-like puggle that will feed on milk that leaks from the mother's abdomen. When young, echidnas lack spines and are hairless, with their appearance being quite rotund and pretty adorable. Like young platypodes, the puggle will stay with its mother for quite a long time, in some cases for up to a year while its spines take shape. Some extinct forms were much larger than any living species, with the most massive being the newly renamed Murray Glossus, from the Pleistocene of Western Australia. Measuring about one metre long and weighing up to 30 kilograms or 66 pounds, this animal was the largest monotreme so far known. It possessed longer, straighter limbs than any modern echidna and probably fed on ants and termites in a semi-arid woodland and scrubland environment. As a whole, echidnas are not as well known as the platypus outside of Australia with the most famous pop cultural depiction of the animal being Knuckles from the Sonic the Hedgehog franchise, although he only resembles the actual animal he's based on in an incredibly loose way. In conclusion then, if there is one takeaway from this video, it is that monotremes, while being basal mammals, 
should be known more for their remarkable adaptations than their supposed strangeness or primitive nature. As we have seen, early Cretaceous members of this group would have resembled more quote-unquote typical mammals, such as shrews or tenrex, lacking beaks and retaining teeth. In this way, we should regard the evolution of the electrosensitive bill as an incredible achievement, with the platypus and echidna successfully holding niches that marsupials generally could not. Their tarsal spurs and egg-laying were not uncommon features of Cretaceous-era mammals, with these traits only appearing bizarre in a world dominated by Therian placentals and to a much lesser degree marsupials. While fairly marginal animals, they have held on in their Australian homeland for over a hundred million years, and we can only hope they continue to do so long into the future. Thanks for watching everyone. The next video will be covering the Bacillosaurid whales, in light of the description of the enormous and incredibly chunky Perucetus, which has dominated paleontological news and memes in recent weeks. See you again soon. Cheerio!